Hi, I'm James Ward, a developer advocate at TypeSafe. I wanted to give you a quick introduction to reactive requests and reactive composition with the TypeSafe Reactive platform. So to do this, I'm going to use TypeSafe Activator. You can get this from TypeSafe.com. And I'm going to go select the Hello Play Framework template to start with. So let me create a new application with this template. So now we're in the Activator interface for this application. And let me show you a little bit about what we can do. We can read through a tutorial that will describe all the code and how things work in the application. I'm not going to use it this time. You can do that on your own. We can also browse through the code of the application. So this allows us to go in and see the source code. We can go make some basic changes to the source code right here within the Activator UI. Or we can open up this project into an IDE. We can also see the compile output from compiling this application. That'll show up here, so you can see it's resolving artifacts and uh, loading the project now. And then once it's done compiling, it'll run the tests for the application, and it'll automatically rerun these tests uh, when, we, when we make any changes to the application. And then we can also see the application uh, running. We can see the running output of the application. And there we go, it's now up and running. Let's go open it up in our browser. So the, now this will be my play application, just the sample application that we're going to start with to describe reactive requests and reactive composition. So here's my little application that I've just created from that template. We can also from here launch the TypeSafe console to get good insight into what's actually going on internally within my application. So let's go back here to the code screen and I'm going to open this project up in IntelliJ. So I'm going to generate the project files for IntelliJ so I can open it up. So this will download all of the Javadoc and sources for all my dependencies in the project so that uh, it makes it easy so that when I'm in IntelliJ I can go through and, um, and drill down into all the code that's underneath my project. So there we go, my project files are created. Let's go here into IntelliJ and I'm going to open up the project and go to my home directory and find this Hello Play app and hit open. So then we'll be able to start making some changes to the code. So let's go browse through the code and uh, first let's, let's just get a quick little intro to how this application is working. So first there's a routes file in play and this defines a mapping between an HTTP verb uh, path and then the code that's going to execute to handle that request. And these can be, uh, these can be regular requests, uh, they can also be web sockets and that sorts of thing. So now in my app directory, this is my main source directory for Java and Scala. With Play, you can write your controllers or anything in, in both Java and Scala. This one has both Java and Scala in it. And so this is where we actually have a controller that, that handles the request and returns a result. So let's, uh, let's start with the very basics here. What I'm going to do is create a new request handler for slash foo. And then this is going to go to uh, controllers.foo. Dot, let's just say get. So now let's go create a new controller here. I'm going to use Scala. You could certainly do everything that I'm going to show in Java as well. So this will be a new object named foo. This is going to extend the base controller in play. The reason why I do that is it's going to bring in some convenience methods that will make it easier for me to, uh, to do some things. So there we go, there's my foo controller, and I'm going to define a new method on this called get. That is what I'm using here uh, in my, my routes file. So this is going to be an action, and an action is something that maps a request and returns a response. So now what I'm going to do is I'm just going to return OK and say ASDF. Let's import in here that action class. So now let's go try this out in the browser. Let's go here to slash foo, and now this will compile that, uh, that new foo class, and then we should see that string here show up once it's finished compiling that, uh, that class. It's also compiling my routes file, so my routes file is type safe, so, uh, so that allows me to have type safety in my routing definition as well as have reverse routing that's also type safe. Okay, so there we go. We see that, that string there now that I outputted. So this request, actually under the covers, is uh, essentially implemented in an asynchronous way uh, in play. But it's not explicitly asynchronous. So what I'm doing is I'm taking a request and returning a, a response, which is an OK, status code 200 OK. Now we can make this explicitly async. Uh, to do that, I can say action.async here. And now what I need to do is not return the actual result, but I need to return a handle 
to something that will produce the result in the future. So in Scala we call these futures and so what I can do is I can create a future and I'm gonna say future.successful and this will now create a future and I still need my OK that's my result so I'm going to create a future that will be fulfilled in the future with this OK and then the string. So that's a handle to something that will produce a result in the future. So now this is asynchronous. So this, this method is going to execute immediately and exit before the request has actually been, uh, been a response has been returned. So now um, that's great. Everything should work the same way that it did before. If I refresh in the browser, then it will recompile and we see the same exact thing that we had before. This is essentially what Play is doing underneath the covers for us, but we can, if we're not actually using anything asynchronous, then we don't have to have the extra boilerplate here of, of doing the dot async in the future wrapping of stuff. So now the only real reason to be async is if we can also be non-blocking. Uh, to be non-blocking, we have to also be async because that means we're going to not block a thread when we're just waiting for the other side to respond. So we need essentially a callback that says, when this, this other thing is done, now call us back with the result. And so I need something to be not blocking on. Um, so kind of an, an easy thing to, to be not blocking on is, is just a, a timeout say all right um, call me back uh, in some amount of time so I'm going to use uh, this promise API here in play and there's a, a timeout function here this takes the uh, the thing that I'm going to return so let's go put that in there as the first parameter and then the second parameter that I need here is going to be the the duration how long I'm going to, to wait um, to do this so let's just do like five seconds here all right, and now I no longer actually need to wrap this in a future because the promise.timeout actually returns a future. So I can remove that part. If we look at promise.timeout API, it returns a future. So I do need to import my uh, dot seconds there that's, that's converting this into a duration. So that's in Scala concurrent and then duration. Uh, and then let's just do underscore there. So now we get my five seconds. So you know, there's one other thing we need to do here is that this timeout actually takes a, a second parameter there, parameter set that's an execution context. So the execution context is basically the thing that's going to map this, this future and this promise down to a thread pool. So this is an abstraction on top of the thread pool so that uh, we can actually con declaratively configure our thread pools through these execution contexts. So uh, if I go try to run this this right now without providing an execution context, then I'm actually going to get a compiler saying that we need to import an execution context in order for this to work. So the, the easy way to do this is just to import the Scala concurrent, uh, and then there's an execution context, and then implicit global. This is just the kind of default execution context in Scala. And this is using implicits to actually fill in that second parameter. I could also just explicitly uh, set that parameter as well. So now if I save this and go back and, and hit reload, then it will recompile that. And then what we should see is the browser should spin for five seconds, and then we return a result. So let's try that again. The browser is spinning for five seconds, and then after that five seconds, we're getting the callback, and it's now uh, returning that result after five seconds. So. Uh, so that's that's now async and non-blocking. So let's look at this again. So my promise at timeout is returning a future of a result, and action.async takes a future of a result. So this line is going to execute immediately. Then I'm not going to be blocking. So the whole five seconds that that browser is spinning, I'm not blocking a thread for this request. And then after that five seconds, I get this callback that returns a result that fulfills the the future, gives the future a value, and then we return the response back out to the browser. So that's great. Now we have something async and non-blocking, but let's do something a little bit more real world. So a typical thing that we can do async and non-blocking is doing a web request out to uh, to some other service. And so the, the Play web service client library that can use JSON and talk to JSON and XML services, that is a reactive library for doing web requests. So let me uh, create a, a web request here with that library. Um, so I'm going to call this one um, JWF for JW Future, and I'm going to call WS, that's the Web Service Client Library. I'm going to set the URL. In this case, let's just do jamesward.com. 
and then I'm going to make a get request. So this get request, what it returns is a future of a response. What we need to do is we're getting back this future of response uh, and we need to actually return a future of a result to uh, for this action.async method. So what I need to do is I need to take this JW future and I need to transform that into a future of a result. So the way to do that is to do a map. So I'm going to say, all right, um, and we can remove uh, this here. I'm going to do a map uh, here and say, all right, let's take this response that we get back. So the map is going to say, when we get this response back from making this request, now uh, transform it in some way. So what I'm going to transform it into is a result. So in this case, my result is going to be status code 200 response okay and then let's just take the response dot body which is just a string um, here and now let's let's return that so now this map method is now returning a future of a result so we've transformed what's inside that future from a future of a response that we got back from calling jamesward.com into a future of results so that we can return a result to to this okay let's go try this out in the browser let's hit refresh so now it'll compile this, and there we see a bunch of text for jamesword.com. I didn't set the content type. We gave it a string, so the default content type is just a text plane. Um, I could, of course, set that to, uh, to the right content type. Okay, so we've now made a request to from my browser. Let's go try it again. We've made a request from my browser to the server. My server now is making a request from it to jamesward.com. So we have two requests, and both of these are now async and non-blocking. So the request coming into my play server, when that's just purely waiting on the other side, uh, there's not actually any threads being used for that request. And then the same thing is also true for the request from my server to jamesward.com. So there's going to be some point in time where I'm I'm just waiting on jamesward.com to respond and during that time there's actually no threads actually allocated to handling this request. So that's a reactive request. That's great. Let's take this one step further. So a lot of times in our applications, we're not just making a request to one service. We're making a request to many services. And so what we can do is let's add in another service here. This one's going to be a request to Twitter. So let's make a request to twitter.com. This is also going to return a future. And now what I want to do is um, wait until both of these requests have, have come back, and then I'm going to return a result. So there's a really nice way to do this in Scala. What I can do is this for comprehension where I'm going to say, all right, now let's take the uh, JW uh, future and when we get a response back from that, let's let's uh, set that into a variable called JW. So that'll actually be my response. And then let's do the same thing for Twitter. So I'm going to take that Twitter future and when we get the, the future completed, then we're going to set that into a Twitter value. And then what I want to do is once both of these things are done, I'm going to do a yield and I'm going to yield OK, again a status code 200 and just kind of an easy thing to show this, I'm going to take the Twitter response body and I'm going to append onto that the JW response body. Um, so now the, the web page should contain a string that's the twitter.com page uh, and appended onto that is the JW um, web page. Now obviously in a real world we'd probably be working with JSON or something like that and be taking Taking these JSON values and doing something with them before we return a response, doing some transformation of that. Um, so we could certainly do that with, with JSON. But let's go check this out and see how this works now. So let's hit refresh here in the browser, and you'll see that now I'm seeing the twitter.com, and then if we scroll way down to the bottom, we'll see the jamesward.com stuff as well. So now we have reactive composition where I'm composing together requests from these reactive requests. So I've got one request from the browser to the play server. I have one request to from the play server to jamesward.com and one request from the server to twitter.com. And there's probably going to be some point in time when all three of these requests are just waiting on the other side to respond. So there will be some point in time where there's actually no threads allocated. And then when I get a response from jamesward.com, that'll fulfill that future. I'll get a response from twitter.com, that'll fulfill fulfill that future and then we'll be able to to fulfill the future that this uh, for comprehension is actually returning which is a, a, a future of a result which contains the data from both of those. So that's reactive composition and reactive requests with PlayFramework and the TypeSafe reactive platform. Try it out by just going to TypeSafe.com and you can click on get started and download activator and give it a try. Thanks for watching.